I wanted to do Deborah alone, but as I studied, I saw that she and JL are in the chapter and their stories are intermeshed, and so you can't really pull them apart. But as we study, if you would like to compare things we say about Deborah to things we have said about Esther, that was really where I thought I was going, but I didn't get to go there. <laughs> um, well, we are in the book of Judges, and we will start with chapter 4. And I put a cycle on your sheet that shows the whole history of the 350 or so years covered by the book of Judges. Now, Moses had left them in a good place, gave them the law and told them to obey it. Joshua had left them in a good place, had all the military campaigns in the promised land, helped them to take that, assigned others to finish the job, told them to be sure and obey God. But then when we come to the book of Judges, it is summed up as the end. Instead of obeying God, every man did what was right in his own eyes. And that was a disaster. Much like what we see in America, where everyone wants to do what's right in their eyes. Um, well, so they would be at peace and serve the Lord, and then they would fall into idolatry, and God would have to deal with that. He would allow them to be captured, oppressed, or even enslaved by other people. They would get real sad then and cry out to God, and God in his mercy would deliver them, raise up a judge to help them get out from under the oppression, and then they would be so happy and they would serve God as long as that judge lived, and then as soon as he was dead, down the tubes again. They went round and round and round that circle. It's always interesting to me when I teach this in Sunday school and the kids say, Miss Bell, why didn't they learn? And I think, well, Lord, why don't I learn? <laughs> why don't we learn? Well, Judges 4 is, uh, it mentions the first ju uh, judge, one of the first three that had died. His name was Ehud, and there were 80 years of peace when he uh helped them get out from under the Moabites. But as soon as he was dead, verse 1 tells us what? They did evil in the sight of the Lord. Now, verse chapter 4 of Judges gives us the story of Deborah and Jael. Chapter 5 is a song of praise that Deborah sang after chapter 4. But we find out some information in that chapter. And so we find out exactly what the evil was in chapter 5, verse 8, did they ever sin? They chose new gods. I didn't know you could do that. <laughs> I mean, they didn't sin a little. They did a lot. And the gods they chose were worshipped with all manner of sexual immorality, with sacrifice of children, all kinds of orgies. It was terrible. This is what they chose. And that was evil in God's sight. And so, verse 2, the Lord, he didn't sell them for money, but he let Jabin, a Canaanite king, conquer them. Uh, and Jabin is a, a title of a king like Pharaoh, so I don't know which Jabin this was, but I know he had a general named Sisera, and they were Canaanites. Uh, up until this time, most of the people who enslaved Israel came from outside their borders. But now they come from inside the, the land of the people of God because they never got rid of them. Um, well, I've given you a little map on the back of your sheet, and it's one of those satellite maps, so it shows you just how uh, dry this land is. Way down at the bottom of your map, they're the towns of Bethel and Ramah, and that's where we find the judge for today, who amazingly is a woman. Now, Jerusalem's just about 10 or 12 miles south, and that body of water is the Sea of Galilee on New Testament maps, but I think you have some understanding of, of where that is. Uh, and verse 3, they're in all this trouble with the Canaanites, and they cry unto the Lord, and the reason they cried was that Sisera, the Canaanite general, had 900 
chariots of iron. You know, you could burn a wood chariot. Uh, iron was a whole different thing. They were the ultimate weapons of war. They also had horses. And you know, God did not let his kings or his people have a bunch of horses because they were good weapons. And so when the Is Israel went to war, they rode donkeys. I'm sure that was a thrill. <laughs> uh, but you're definitely an underdog <laughs> compared to horses. But the end of verse 3 says that the Canaanites for 20 years had not just oppressed Israel a little bit, but mightily oppressed them. And they didn't have weapons of war. Uh, I don't know why it took 20 years for the children of Israel to say, hey, this is bad. We need to turn back to God. <laughs> but it did. Uh, in chapter 5, we have a couple of details about this time. In verse 6, Deborah tells us that people couldn't go on the highways because there were raids by the Canaanites to, uh, to get their stuff and kill them. And so they had to walk through fields and stuff when they went anywhere. And in verse 7, it tells us you couldn't live in the villages. You had to go to a wall city because the Canaanites oppressed them. This sounds like a bad time, doesn't it? And actually, it's a time as Americans in this millennium we could not even imagine because we have never lived like that. Well, verse 4, Deborah a prophetess who's married to an interesting guy. She was the judge of Israel. That just is so casual, but there's something amazing here. <laughs> this is a woman who's a leader of a nation. Uh, the name Deborah means bee, like the insect. Uh, yes, in Egypt, the bee was always a symbol of Pharaoh and was on every Pharaoh's insignia. It was a symbol of royalty. Maybe that's because they had a queen bee. I don't know. <laughs> and it's very unusual that God chose a woman. And I was surprised in study to have all the scholars say this chapter is the most studied chapter in Judges because people are looking for proof that women could be national leaders. Now, the book of Judges is dark and not anything I would watch on TV or read a book about. But this is one that people like to look at. But I loved an old commentator, Matthew Henry, who wrote in the 1700s, at night, with the light of a candle, after his day's work, he wrote the best commentary there may be on the scripture. He says of Deborah, her name meaning be, suggests Deborah. She was industrious. She had sharp perception or discernment. She was greatly useful and she produced sweetness to her friends and stings to her enemies. <laughs> so maybe that was a good name for her. And I think the Spirit of, Scott, of God spoke to him because there weren't that many commentaries when he wrote his. So, I look at verse 4. There's an interesting phrase there. It says, Deborah is a prophetess, and we're going to come back to that. And she is the wife of Lapidoth. Uh, his name means lightning flashes. Might have been an interesting husband. <laughs> uh, but we're told nothing else else about him, and this is the only place in the Bible his name is mentioned. Uh, I'm glad it says she was the wife of Lapidoth, instead of Lapidoth was the husband of Deborah. Did you catch that? <laughs> that tells you something else about Deborah. Uh, well, there are many exceptional things about her. Number one, that verse says she judged Israel. That is, she was set apart by God for national leadership. The people recognized it, and they asked her legal questions. This is like a governing authority. Deborah apparently knew the law of God, 
like Moses had. Uh, there was no other precedent in the Bible of a woman in this position, nor was there one after Deborah. Now there was in history, you who are my age probably remember Golda Meir. She was prime minister of Israel from like 69 to 74. I want to tell you, she was a general. <laughs> uh, she did this job as a woman in her 70s. And I will tell you, all the other men in government, when she said jump, they said how high. <laughs> uh, in reading about her, I was interested to see she was born in the Ukraine. And there used to be a very lovely monument to her in the city of Kiev. I wonder if it's still there after the bombing. She was a remarkable woman. Now, God, God let her do that. I don't know that God put her there. No, I think he did because he sets up rulers. He does who he wants to, uh, much to the dismay of the men who wanted to be prime minister. <laughs> but uh, we don't have any scripture about her. <laughs> but Deborah was not only a judge, she was also a prophet or a girl prophet is a prophetess. That meant she spoke forth God's word. God told her something and she said it. Now, did they have Bible back then? They had the books of Moses, probably in the Ark of the Covenant, maybe read by the priest, followed by the priest. But people did not have Bible. And if you were going to know what God said, someone had to be the mouthpiece. Uh, and Deborah was this. How lucky we are to have the completed word of God. We can pick it up. That is why I don't think we need a prophetess today. Now, some have the gift of prophecy. That is the gift of speaking forth the word of God. But it is the completed word of God. They speak forth and not new things that they add to the word of God. Be very careful when somebody tells you they have something uh, God revealed to them because God revealed everything we need for life and practice and that's finished. Uh, well, uh, Moses was one that people used to come to for judgments and it got too much for him. And his father-in-law suggested, why don't you get some people to help you he picked out 70 men, and the Bible says, The Lord came down and took the spirit that was on Moses and gave it to the 70 elders. And when the spirit was on them, they prophesied. They spoke forth God's word. And I think that's what, how Deborah did that. God's spirit came on her. God's spirit gave us the rest of the word. God's spirit came on her, and she could speak, speak it out. Uh, well, I think that she was also a godly woman, although that word is not used in this chapter, because of all the judges in the book of Judges, she's the only one that didn't do something bad. <laughs> and she's also one of the four that we have several verses about. Some of them are just mentioned in a verse. We don't know much. There's a lot about Deborah. There's this chapter in chapter 5. There's a lot about Gideon. And he started out good, but he didn't end so well. Then there's Jephthah, my least favorite, who foolishly said to God, if you'll give me a victory, I'll offer as a sacrifice to you whatever I see first when I get home. Boy, that was foolish. And it was his daughter that came out. And then the other one is Samson. We know he, Samson, he had a lot of problems with women. Now, those are the four that we know the most about. I tell you what, you would not have to have a very big descriptor of me to find sin. I might be fine if it was just like 10 seconds. <laughs> uh, we have a lot about Deborah and nothing is said there. And we're told in verse 5 that she dwelt under a palm tree, which was a little bit unusual on this road, and the children of Israel came to her. So they knew that she was God's judge. And verses 6 and 7 says she either sends a message to Barak, 
who is an army general for Israel, or she goes up to Barak. Uh, and I want you to know that he was, she is down here, and Barak was way up here. <laughs> and that was about 90 miles if you were a crow <laughs> and could fly straight. But you can just imagine what the roads were like. Uh, they're going to have a conversation in verses 8 and 9, so I think she went up there. Uh, but this is her message from God. Go toward Mount Tabor, which is uh, right here. It's got a circle around it on your map in the middle. And take 10,000 men from these two tribes, and God will draw to you Sisera, the captain of Jabin's army, with his chariots and his multitudes, and you'll win. I will deliver him into your hand. No word about how this is going to happen. Uh, but you notice in everything that Deborah says, she is talking about what God said. She didn't say, I think this would be a good idea. She said, God said, do this. Uh, and the key there is God will deliver him to you. Now, how does General Barak feel about that? Look at verse 8. <laughs> well, I don't know if he is a chicken. One pastor wanted to title his sermon on this passage, Wonder Woman and the Wimp. <laughs> but I, I'm not sure that's quite fair. <laughs> Maybe Barak just realizes we don't have any weapons. Not only do we not have horses, not only do we not have wooden chariots, we don't have weapons because people who conquered Israel wouldn't let them have blacksmiths that would make message, weapons for them. In fact, Deborah says that in chapter 5, verse 8, in her song, she says, was there one shield or spear among the thousands of Israel? That's a rhetorical question. There wasn't <laughs> one. So Barak says, well, if you will go with me, I will go. But if you will not go, I will not go. So I see her as an encourager. She's going to encourage Barak. I don't know if he was afraid or if he was just a good general and he thought, I don't have as many men and we're not armed. I don't think this would be a good idea. I think that would be a logical thing for him to think. Uh, in chapter 5, she also calls herself a mother in Israel. She doesn't call herself uh, a general, and she is not going to lead the army. Well, she tells him in verse 9, I'll surely go with you, but Barak, i got to tell you that the credit for the victory is not going to go to you as the general. It's going to go to a woman. And so reading that, you think the credit's going to go to Deborah. But that's not what she was talking about. Uh, now, God could have destroyed the Canaanites without any of these people in this chapter. But he chose a general of dubious courage or choices, and he chose two women whom nobody would believe could do anything. So we have something remarkable here. Uh, maybe he did. Or maybe she was as a leader, as Harry Truman said, a good leader is somebody that can make people do what they don't want to do and like it. <laughs> so maybe she helped Barack <laughs> in that way. And verse 10 says that Barack goes up with 10,000 and Deborah is there. 10,000 and one man and Deborah. Uh, well, verses 11 through 13 tell us that some allies of the Canaanites gave some espionage to Sisera. And they told Sisera that Barak was there with all these men and that he was on this mountain. Uh, they, these are Kenite people whom I had to look up. I did not remember. They were probably descendants of the brother of Moses' 
wife when he was a shepherd. Uh, the King James says father-in-law, but that is a word that can be translated father-in-law or brother-in-law. And there's a place in Numbers that says Moses' father-in-law was the father of this guy that's named in that verse. Uh, so poor Barak, he's not even going to have the element of surprise. Can you imagine how he felt standing on Mount Tabor? And if you look on your map, this kind of brown area, this is all a huge plain, and there have been many battles fought on that plain. And actually, that's where the last battle will take place, where the Battle of Armageddon will be. Um, so he's on the mountain, and you see the yellow down here. Uh, Sisera has drawn from all these Canaanite cities and coming up to meet him. If he had uh, 900 chariots, that was usually about 5% of your number of people. So he, he's coming up with a large, lot larger crowd. And Deborah has to speak to Barak again. Look at verse 14. She says, what? Barak, up. <laughs> Do you ever do that, mothers? You called your kids, you called your kids. They're not up. You open that door, you turn on the light, you say, up. <laughs> That's just what the mother of Israel did <laughs> for Barak. She didn't even say, get up. <laughs> she said, the Lord has already delivered Sisera into your hand, and he's gone out before you. And Barak thought, well, I don't see anything. <laughs> I don't hear anything. I hear them coming. I see the dust. I hear the horses. I see their weapons glistening in the sun. Well, I'm proud of Barak, and I don't think he was a wimp because the last part of 14 says, okay, he heads down with his little unarmed force. But I want you to notice that who is leading that army? Is it Deborah? Barak. Barak. They both have a strength. Barak is a general and Deborah is a leader. And it takes both of their strengths to kind of mesh together, kind of like the body of Christ. We all have gifts and strengths. And when we are together, we are more effective than any of us alone. Well, verse 15 says in the King James, the Lord discomfited Sisera. Do some of your translations have another word there, another verb? What did the Lord do to Sisera? Sisera coming with all his iron chariots and all his soldiers were routed. And in chapter 4, we are not told how. But in chapter 5, verse 20, in her song of praise, Deborah talks about this moment. And she says, they fought from heaven. The stars in their courses fought against Sisera. And then she says in 21, the river that was at the foot of this mountain swept them away. It may be that God sent a storm of rain and wind or hail, and God is fighting for them. You've seen the flash flood, flood footage on TV. A lot of rain in a very short time can flood a river. And it got to where in verse 22 in chapter 5, their horse hoofs got broken because they were maneuvering in this storm. I think the horses would be alarmed by the storm as well. So you've got chaos. But how effective are iron chariots in mud? How about that? <laughs> what a wonderful idea. Well... Back in chapter 4, the Lord routed Sisera, chapter uh, verse 15, and it says he got off his chariot and ran away. What a general. Now there's your wimp. <laughs> Barak went to the fight. Sisera ran away from the fight. And verse 16 says Barak pursued after the chariots and the host, and he, sh he chased them all the way from there down in here. And all the, host of, all the host of Syria fell 
by the edge of the sword, and there was not one man left. That's unbelievable. That's the most amazing victory in the history of the world, except for maybe the Red Sea. <laughs> that was a pretty big one. But we're going to look at verse 17. Let's follow Sisera. It says he fled away on his feet to the tent of Jael, the wife of that guy that had helped him know what was happening. And that is from this battle site up here under the Sea of Galilee is where he went. And that there was some kind of peace treaty between the Canaanite king and her husband. Uh, people wonder why he had made a treaty with the Canaanites, but all the Kenites were blacksmiths. And maybe they had some kind of agreement where they could work. Or maybe he had a used iron chariot place where Sisera got all his chariots. <laughs> or maybe he repaired the chariots. There's, there's some affinity. This is strange that they would do this. Uh, and so he flees to the tent of this man's wife, J.L. Now, I want you to think, did she have a cell phone with breaking news? Did she know Sisera? Probably not. She might know of him, but she probably never seen him before. Did she know about the battle? Maybe not. It happened quick. I don't think she was close enough to have heard it, but she might have known. I don't think there was a lot of talk about the battle. Sisera just came up this way, Barak came down this way, and pow, <laughs> it happened quick. Well, look at what happens in verse 18. And before you make a judgment, I want you to think what you would do in such a circumstance. Jael goes out to meet him. Now, she may not have known he was Sisera, or she may have known. But I think she surely knew he was a soldier because he had run away from battle, and he still would have had on his soldier clothes. And I guarantee you, he didn't run away without a weapon. So here is this man, and he has run all this distance. I bet he looks rather poor right now and is breathing heavy. And she goes out to him, and she says, Turn in, my Lord, turn in to me. She is inviting him into her private tent, which was a huge brooch of, that yeah, was a big no-no. And she says to him, don't be afraid. And when he had turned into her tent, when he went in, she covered him with a mantle or a blanket. I think he walked in the tent and he fell on the ground. I'm sure he was tired. Now we could say, oh, she shouldn't help Sisera. He's the enemy of Israel. His king has, turned, has caused all this mighty oppression for 20 years. And she says, here, hide in my tent. Don't be afraid. Uh, or did she just see a soldier that was in difficult straits and didn't know what he would do with his weapons? We don't know. Verse 19 says, Sisera said to her, give me some water because I am really thirsty. And she does better than water. She gives him what? Milk. And she gives him this milk to drink, and she tucks him in. This sounds like a child, doesn't it? You want him to go to sleep? <laughs> you give him some milk and tuck him in. Now, I still, at this point, don't know what J.L. knew about him. But verse 20, I think her alarms might go off when he says, stand in the door of your tent, and if anybody comes looking, <laughs> say, and they say, is there any man in there? Lie and say, no. Hmm, who would be looking for you? Why are they looking for you? And the scripture doesn't say that she answered that. But I guess by not answering, she might have given the impression she was going to guard the door. And so he falls asleep. And then verse 21's the kicker. 
She goes out and takes a tent peg and a hammer and goes in while he's asleep and hit that tent peg through his temples and fastened it to the ground on the other side. Now that's more information than I would like to have. You know, in this time, women were the ones who had to set up and take down the tents. And Kenites moved around much more than the Israelites did. They were kind of like Bedou Bedouins. Uh, and I wonder how many times she had hammered in tent pegs and thought, Lord, I just hate this. <laughs> Why do I have to do this? I bet she had strong arms. <laughs> uh, well, she's killed the enemy of Israel and the guy that her husband had a treaty with. This is complicated. And actually, if she killed him while he was asleep, I think he was defenseless. So do we blame her for what she did? Or do we praise her for all these violations of laws well verse 22 Barak was not that far behind him because as soon as this happens this could have happened in five minutes uh, Barak comes and she doesn't say there's nobody in my tent she said I'll show you who you're, <laughs> who you're looking for and your job's already done <laughs> uh, and that's that Bible word, behold. Sisera went in. He could not believe it. There was his enemy with a nail in his temples. Well, as you can imagine, people are all over the map, whether she, what she did was right or what she did was wrong. And it is difficult. First of all, I'd like you to look at the outcome of what she did. Look at the last two verses in chapter 4. What happened that day in regard to the national enemy of Israel? God, God subdued them, okay? And we have already read that Barak had killed every member of Sisera's army. And what happened in verse 24? They prospered. they prospered. And they kept chasing Jabin until they got him. Now, that's exactly what God had told them to do when Joshua brought the people in. He said, you, you'd have to take out these people. They've had their chance to repent. They did not repent. They are evil, and they will tempt y'all, and you take them out. And when they did not do that, it set up this situation. It's interesting to me that Canaanites, as these people are called, never oppressed the children of Israel again militarily now they kept their idols and that was a snare and some of them by the time of the kings the Canaanites were called Philistines and it was still a controversy but this is the last time Canaanites are mentioned in that way and back in Deuteronomy not just before Joshua Moses had said from the Lord when God delivers these people to you, smite them and utterly destroy them and make no covenant with them and do not show mercy. That was God's directive. Again, that's in Deuteronomy 7, Deuteronomy 20. He says, utterly destroy them that they teach you not to sin against God. So God had told the Israelites to do this. Now, this is still such a strange story to me, but I tried to think. Suppose in World War II, some woman in Germany had assassinated Hitler at the beginning of World War II. Would that have been a good thing or a bad thing for the Allies? <laughs> well, but it bothers me that in this text, I don't see J.L. saying anything about what she did or why she did it, or how she thought of it. And whoever wrote the book of Judges gives us no clue. Good thing, bad thing. But there's another outcome we need to look at, and that's what does God's word say about Jael. Look in chapter 5, verse 24.
This is in the Song of Deborah. She's blessed a little bit. <laughs> blessed above women shall Jael, the wife of the turncoat <laughs> blacksmith, <laughs> blessed shall she be above all women who dwell in tents. Uh, Jabin had mistreated the Israelites for years. The military had oppressed and killed them. In fact, in the next verses, Deborah says, what about Sisera's mother? She's looking for him to come back from war. And the women who are with her says, oh, all the men probably have a girl or two. What do you think happened to Jewish young women in war? Do you listen to the news? What still happens? So, uh, Jael put an end to that, didn't she? And actually, Deborah and Jael accomplished what the men of Israel had never done, in spite of God giving them specific commands for these many years. Well, now, what is the lesson for us to sharpen your hammer muscles? <laughs> You know, this is like the lesson from Esther when they were going to go out and destroy their enemies. We don't think this way. Men love the war stories. We like the romance stories. <laughs> so this is hard for us. But I believe this is showing us the attitude that God has towards sin against him. He wants it annihilated and out of there. Now, the one I'm to do that for is me. That's my sin. He wants me to be that tough against that because it, it, it's a sin against him, but it influences others if it's in my life. Now, that's the best lesson I can get from Deborah. I admire her that no uh, negative thing is said, that every time she opens her mouth, it's about praise of God. If you read chapter 5, I mean, she praised the common people who were willing to fight. She criticized some tribes who weren't willing to fight. But she, it's a lot of praise for God in chapter 5. And she praised Barak and his men. Look at the last chap verse in chapter 5. This is the last verse of her song that she sang. Let all thine enemies perish, O Lord, but let them that love him be as the sun when he shines in his might. Has that happened yet? Deborah saw to the end. <laughs> Lord, your enemies are not going to prevail. They look like they are, but they are not. And then the wonderful blessing of the last sentence. What finally happened for in Israel? 40 years of peace. One of the longer peace times in Israel.